welcome everyone to the QSide Colloquium series. Um, we are really excited to have you all here today and, um, and to welcome the second person in our fall 2020 series. And uh, couldn't be more excited about this uh, opportunity. So thank you all for coming. My name is Jude Higdon. I'm the Chief Operations Officer for the QSide Institute. For those of you who aren't familiar with QSide, we are the Institute for the Quantitative Study of Inclusion, Diversity, and Equity. We focus on uh, quant using innovative and cutting edge quantitative research methods and data science and social science methodologies and partner with activist organizations and individuals to uh, work towards social justice aims. And uh, there's a lot more information on our website at uh, qsideinstitute.org. A few operational notes. At the end of this session, for anyone who has some additional time, um, we will be having a little informal cocktail or coffee hour um, to uh, just do a sort of a meet and greet. And you are welcome to join us. And uh, depending on how large our attendee pool is, we will either adjourn to a more standard uh, meeting room or I will just promote everyone who uh, is still around up into becoming a panelist and we'll just stay in this room. So we'll sort of play that one by ear. Uh, I wanna encourage all of you who are with us today uh, if you're not officially a member of our affiliate program or uh, our consortium program, please consider joining. The affiliate program is free to join. Um, that is an opportunity to engage with the organization at a couple of different levels, and you can find more information on our website. The consortium program is a paid membership program, um, and it funds the colloquium as well as other events uh, throughout the year. And uh, we encourage you to think about that. If we never want um, uh, funding to be prohibitive for anyone. So if there are scholarships available and there are ways to join as an individual, a department or an institution, I will put the links um, to the affiliate program and the consortium program in the chat here in just a moment. And finally, as everybody is beginning to think about uh, end of year donations, if you, uh, you know, have a 50 burning a hole in your wallet and you uh, would like to, to put it toward a, a worthy nonprofit uh, tax, tax deductible donation, we are always um, grateful for, uh, for that. So um, I will also put the link to our um, donations page in the chat. As we progress through our session today, please feel free to ask questions through the Q&A feature in the webinar. Um, I will collect some of those up and we will present them to Sam at the end during our Q&A time. Uh, one last note, I want to remind everyone that we do record these sessions. So um, if you do choose to participate, um, I may mention your name um, or, or uh, talk about that. So it would be on uh, social media. We post these recordings there. So uh, just please be advised that this is being recording. And now without further ado, it's my great privilege to introduce today's speaker, Sam Tweedy. Samantha Tweedy serves as the Chief Partnerships and Impact Officer at Robinhood, a role she was instrumental in creating at New York City's largest anti-poverty organization. She sets the strategy, strategy for and manages the team marshaling capital, attention, and resources to the programs and organizations that are proven to be most effective in the fight against poverty. Her key achievements since joining in 2018 include establishing the innovative 15 million Power Fund to invest in leaders of color-led organizations that address economic injustice, launching the High Quality Schools Fund to support the opening of 25 new schools serving New York City's most under-resourced community and students, and instituting Robin Hood's first participatory initiative to directly engage community members in the organization's grant making. She also designs and leads the execution of Robin Hood's premier national annual thought leadership conference, No City Limits, Reimagining the Poverty Fight, which convenes community leaders, nonprofits, academics, policymakers, funders, 
and corporate leaders to explore the most effective solutions for increasing economic mobility. Prior to joining Robinhood, Sam served as the Chief Advancement Officer and Senior Director for External Impact for Uncommon Schools. As the organization's first Chief Advancement Officer, she defined the vision and successfully led the implementation of a comprehensive external engagement and communications strategy and served as a member of the executive team, playing a key role in decisions about the strategic direction of Uncommon's 52 schools in three states with 2,400 staff members and a $300 million budget. Beyond defining and leading Uncommon's brand and external voice and helping to secure new school sites across six cities, she and her team raised 50 million in public and private grants. Her hands-on educational experience includes funding and co-directing the Brooklyn-based Excellence Girls, an elementary school that won the National Blue Ribbon Award in honor of closing racial and economic achievement gaps and its fierce female curriculum. And as the head of the School for Excellence Boys, a college preparatory all boys elementary and middle school. In this role, Samantha managed a staff of 100 and devoted herself to building relationships with families that fostered students academic success and long term goals. Following her graduation from Yale Law, Law School, where she was the director of the legal advocacy clinics education group and a member of the executive board of the Black Law Students Association. She worked as a litigation attorney at Simpson, Thatcher, and Bartlett LLP. At Simpson, she represented a nonprofit school finance reform coalition and impact litigation on behalf of New York City's under-resourced communities and corporate entities on issues including negligence, tax indemnification, and regu regulatory compliance. In addition to her law degree, Samantha holds a BA, magna cum laude, from Duke University, she lives in Brooklyn with her husband and two children, who are awesome, Stokely and Evers, and is a board member of a number of organizations dedicated to policy, education, and youth service, including Next 100, Coney Island Prep, and Change Summer. And I'm realizing after reading all that that I, uh, I need to get on the ball here. Um, so Sam, we are just absolutely so grateful to you for being with us today. Um, I will go ahead and mute my video, but if you need anything, um, and please, uh, everyone join me in welcoming um, Sam Tweedy to QSide. Thank you, Jude. My two lessons learned already from this session are, if you, tell me, if you told me you were going to read the bio, I would have cut it by half. I hope you all are still with me. And that the beauty, one of the few of the current state we're living in where everything on Zoom is that you've actually met my children. <laughs> and so those connections are invaluable. Um, I'm truly grateful to Jude, to Chad, to the whole QSI team uh, for having me here today. I would say that the Q-Side mission is no more important today than it's always been. I think that work has always been just as important as it is now, but that there is likely even more potential for impact of the work than ever before. And so I'm just so grateful to now be a part of the Q-Side family. And to everyone who's with us today, I'm thrilled to be in conversation with you and particularly thrilled to be in conversation with you in this moment. In this moment where we have run out of adjectives that mean unprecedented to describe it, run out of adjectives that marry the crisis and the concern with what are slivers of opportunity for all of us who are focused on increasing justice to make change and where we're all seeking and searching internally, externally for how and where and how far we can go. This moment where we watched a pandemic and are watching still a pandemic that was so often in the early days heralded as the great equalizer, be anything but, wreak havoc on our communities of color as we watch four times as many Black and Latinx and Native Americans fall victim to this infection as compared to their white American counterparts. And we know we watch the pandemic just prey on the structural inequities of our society, on low wage workers called to stay on the front lines, on those without easy access to strong health care, on those with underlying health conditions, so often born out of living in food deserts or in apartments with lead filled paint. And we in this moment are still 
experiencing this long overdue, generations overdue national reckoning around anti-Black systemic racism and racial injustice. This moment where we collectively as a society watched a police officer hold down on the neck of Mr. George Floyd for eight minutes and 46 seconds. And it felt like we didn't even have the amount of time to think, to process, to breathe, to grieve before we were talking about Mr. Floyd alongside, yes, a long, long, long list of names that came before him, but on names that came after him, Jacob Blake and others. In this moment where we are nearing the end of an administration that for four years has also wrecked havoc on communities of color. And in this moment, we're just a few days from watching an election that was in no way a repudiation of those last four years and what they meant for marginalized communities, but rather an election that put on stark display in high definition, the vast numbers of our country people who would be excited or at least comfortable with that element of the last four years being the status quo, being our future. Because of all of this, we're in a moment right now where so many people are asking questions, new questions, different questions, personally, professionally, around the dinner table, around the board table, in the halls of power, in the halls of community, and where at least publicly, Folks are often feeling held to different expectations. A moment where Black Lives Matter rolls off the tongue of so many you never would have thought would utter the words. And where we're seeing headlines like US companies flood civil rights groups with donations. And we watched companies pledge $450 million to address these racial issues. Now, I don't say any of this to sound optimistic. Optimism is actually not my stance. I say all of this because I'm equally excited, <coughs> excuse me, to be talking to you all in this moment where the history books have in no way closed on what this year, what 2020, what these conflated crises and moments of reckoning are gonna mean. Is it a blip? Will it be a sea change? And there are some deeply worrisome signs about which way this will go when we look at the fact that in June, a majority of white adults, 60%, said they supported the movement for Black lives at least somewhat. And now fewer than half, already down to 45%, express that support. So there are no rose-colored glasses being worn here about whether what we have watched and witnessed, participated in, thought about, learned, will leave the world in a better place for my kids or for any of us. But I wanna underscore my excitement about having this conversation with this group because it is my deep belief that it is data. How we capture it, how we analyze it, and so importantly, how and where we tell narratives and stories about it that are gonna play a huge role in whether the history books close on this as a year that certainly will go down in them or close as a year that truly turned the corner for some real systemic change around justice, around equity, around a better future. Now, full disclosure, all disclaimers here, I say this as a data enthusiast, I say this as somebody who in my entire professional life has been in roles in organizations only that are committed to being driven by data. I do not say this as the data expert. So I will not bury the lead in any way and let you know now that my hope is that our conversation today serves as some sort of a call to action for all of you who are leading the charge in this space to think about how to take advantage of all that is so hard in this moment of crisis and of confusion and of conflict in our country to find a way to let data drive us forward for good. So I will be completely honest with you. I'll take you on a little, a little uh, Samantha history here just to prove my point. Um, I was one of 20 black students who was 
fortunate enough, um, fortunate in a complicated way, uh, to attend what is seen as the premier specialized math and science high school in New York City and, and, and one of the best in the country. And Jude, if you want to invite me back for a whole other conversation about why that number was only 20 out of 800 and why now that number, and I'm dating myself a little bit here, is only seven out of 800 in any class that's coming in, I would be more than happy to come back and talk about that. So I'll just put that to the side. My point here is that in this premier math and high school, uh, math and science high school, what you would find Sam doing uh, anytime she had a choice was studying poetry. So a data enthusiast, uh, a data champion, proximate to data always, uh, but really hoping that for those who are spending their waking hours, sleeping hours, dreaming hours, conversation hours, employment hours, thinking about that, thinking about data and how it drives change, that this conversation uh, will offer some help and some support in figuring out what we truly can do to capture this moment to make a difference. Uh, I spend my time, as you heard uh, Jude share these days, uh, at Robin Hood, which is the New York City's largest anti-poverty organization. Uh, and I joined um, that organization about two years ago. And it's my first role in philanthropy. I've spent a lot more of my time, as you heard, uh, thinking about the direct service organizations, the issues, et cetera, that philanthropy is uh, working to serve. Now, when I think about philanthropy, in some, at the headline level, philanthropy is in the business of trying to solve our world's problems. Whether it's Robin Hood and our mission to increase mobility from poverty, to help families on pathways out of poverty for good, whether it's philanthropists who are providing support in the wake of a natural disaster or in the moment of a pandemic, uh, whether it's philanthropists who are supporting hospitals or even philanthropists who are supporting alma maters, institutes, institutions of education that are educating, informing, preparing our next generation. Philanthropy is and sees itself in the business of addressing society's challenges, of solving problems. And yet, Philanthropy has a big problem. As a really beautiful recent study, which I recommend you read by Bridge Band Group and Echoing Green displays, even though we in philanthropy know that race is one of the most reliable predictors of life outcomes across nearly any measure, life expectancy, academic achievement, income, wealth, physical and mental health, maternal morbidity, the list goes on and on. What is so often missing from philanthropy's discussions about achieving results is how much successfully changing the world depends on bringing an intentional, explicit, and sustained focus to addressing racial disparities across the problems we're trying to solve. That we often in philanthropy ignore, don't discuss, turn a colorblind eye to the need to bring this intentional, this direct, this outstated focus on addressing racial disparities across the problems we're trying to solve. So let me talk about that a little bit in the philanthropic space dedicated to poverty fighting. Um, and I'm going to take you, if you will bear with me, on a bit of a journey here with me uh, to share a New York Times piece that came out when the economist Raj Chetty out of Harvard and Stanford combined longitudinal, longitudinal Census Bureau data on race with IRS tax returns to analyze the sources of racial disparities from an intergenerational perspective. So give me a moment just to share my screen. Okay. All right, and somebody send me a note in the chat if you can't see this, please. So I had just accepted my role at Robin Hood. And what 
you, oh, I'm just checking the chat to make sure. Um, and yes, Jude, are we all good? We see it. Perfect. Okay. So I had just accepted my role at Robin Hood. And what you didn't hear in the overly long bio that I shared with Jude about my role at Robin Hood was that I was coming in with an intentional focus of bringing a racial equity lens to the organization and hopefully to the philanthropic sector right around adjacent to like Robin Hood. Because I had spent years and years working in organizations that were funded by Robin Hood and organizations and philanthropy, philanthropies like Robin Hood. I had deeply experienced that while, for example, when I was running schools, our entire mission was focused on the racial opportunity and achievement gaps, that when we were in conversations with funders, so often what we heard was a colorblind approach. Let's talk about education not race. Let's talk about schooling, not race. Let's talk about poverty fighting, not race. And what was so clear to me from the work on the ground was that those elements could never be disaggregated. And so when I woke up one morning, uh, having signed my contract, ready to start, but not having started yet, and opened this New York Times page, I was stunned. And I open it today because I also think it's one of the most impactful data visualizations that I've seen. So I'm just going to scan through it to let you experience this with me for the moment, if it's not something you've ever watched on your own. And what you'll see is that the different colored chits are showing the experiences of boys who grew up in families with different economic levels by race and seeing where they ended up as adults. Okay, so that share should have stopped and if it didn't, Jude, let me know. So what the study showed was that a black child born to parents in the top income quartile was just as likely to fall into the bottom income quartile in adulthood as to stay in the top, compared to white children who were nearly five times as likely to remain in the top quartile as they were to fall in the bottom quartile. And that the disparity remained regardless of the present state of wealth or poverty in a household. So that black adults who have roughly the same chances of experiencing poverty, regardless of whether they were ever poor as children or not. So I opened this page, I read the article, I went straight to the study, I watched it over and over again. And I sent a text to our CEO, who would soon be my boss, to say, oh my goodness, our work is going to be so much easier now. There's no way you can look at this and not have it jump off the page. There's no way you can look at this and start a conversation around fighting poverty, around increasing mobility from poverty without seeing that that conversation can exist without attending to race. So you all will know where this story goes next, which is I started at Robin Hood a few months later, and this is not a conversation that we were only having at Robin Hood. This is a, phil this is a philanthropic conversation. Those who were focused on economic mobility and on fighting poverty were heavily reliant on this Raj Chetty study. People had completely upended their priorities. There were new strategic plans that had been built. That was how instrumental the sum total of the data that the study revealed had been. What had not changed though was the conversation about the interplay of racial and economic injustice. And this data, while it was striking, while it was remarkable, while the data visualization was incredible, it wasn't new. It echoed what anyone who had spent decades in the trenches, whether on the front lines or on the philanthropic lines of increasing mobility from poverty, had seen. We've always looked at a college degree as, as silver bullet as you can get knowing there is no silver bullet to leaving and staying out of poverty. But if there was one, we so often talk about the college degree. And we should. It increases lifetime earnings by nearly a million dollars. But what does the research all also show? 
that black college graduates on average earn less than white high school dropouts. And that white Americans who dropped out of high school have a median net worth that's greater than blacks and black and Latinx Americans who have a college degree. We look at workforce, so often thinking about attaining and then holding on to that higher wage job, that steady income as a pathway out of poverty. What does the data also tell us? That employers are two times as likely to hire a white applicant as they are an equally qualified black applicant for an entry level position. And that employers are just as likely to hire a white American recently released from prison as a black American applicant with no criminal history. And so what this data in this space, but as we look across all sectors, across every aspect of American life, we see reflected back is that systemic racism interplays with every single area of our American life. And that if we continue to look at data as about race or about economics, about poverty or about race, as opposed to as one whole, then we are telling an incomplete story, which is always going to lead to incomplete solutions. And that the solutions are going to be incomplete and insufficient and often ineffective for those communities of color, for those individuals of color, whose story through the data, whose experiences, lived experiences, priorities, needs, are simply being analyzed, oftentimes in a spotlight feature or a special data box or a second analysis that's dealing with diversity data or disparity data or race data. And so my belief in this moment as reflected by experience through the philanthropic world and through the poverty fighting world is that we have to figure out in our collection, our analysis and our storytelling about the data, how to make this interplay of racial injustice and every other element, every other sector, every other area, our starting point, the origin story, the origin story that that is the whole that drives the questions we ask so that it's that whole that gets to the answers because it's those answers that we're relying on to drive the solutions, the solutions that we invest in, the solutions that we scale, the solutions as we promote as game changing. And so to be able to make this demand in our life as data collectors, analyzers, and those who go out and promote and tell the story of the data, I believe can have a tremendous impact on our way forward. And that this unprecedented moment we're in right now offers us the opportunity to demand that. So let me share a bit of what we've done at Robinhood to try to move this forward. Our first step, and I think this is just so critically important for all of us, both as individuals and as professionals and leaders or in our space as students to do is take this moment to look ourselves in the mirror. How do we understand what we are both being charged to do in this moment and both have the opportunity to do in this moment in our core business? This is not to say that all of the new initiatives, the new funds, the you know, one-time investments in black communities, in black leaders, et cetera, aren't valuable. I'll take all of them we can get. What I'll also say is that if we only do that, if we relegate our change making in this moment to those one-off outside of our core business areas, then I don't believe the kind of systemic change that is required in literally every organization, company, around every dinner table in our country, that level of holistic change that's needed 
of systemic change that's needed, I don't believe will come about unless we all start with our core business. So Robinhood, we are really an engine of mobility from poverty. We have given out over $3 billion into the poverty fighting space over the last three plus decades. We do policy work. We lead thought leadership conferences. We work to build partnerships that expand our impact. At the same time, our core business has always been grant making. Finding, seeking, investing in, supporting and scaling those nonprofit po poverty fighting organizations that are most effective. And so what we built over the last number of months in our effort to hardwire organizationally and in across the philanthropic sector, this understanding that you can't talk about poverty without talking about race is a new initiative called the Power Fund, where we are investing in leaders of color who are leading organizations that address that interplay really well. Um, and you just popped some information about the Power Fund into the chat box if you're interested in learning more about it. The question that we sought to answer when we launched the Power Fund is how, <laughs> over the past two decades, while philanthropic giving overall has skyrocketed by about 400%, are we watching leaders of color-led organizations stay stagnant at receiving only 10% of philanthropic investment? Just 10% of philanthropic investments. Now there's a ton of research and data out there that shows the barriers that leaders of color face in securing funding. And we built the power fund to address, to tear down, to move past, to climb over those barriers. Because what was so clear to us was that if we were serious about saying that you can only fight poverty by addressing systemic racism, then it was obvious that those with the lived experience of the communities that they were working to solve for example, in a city like New York, where 80% of those living in poverty are people of color, we're going to oftentimes be best suited to bring about the solutions that would work and that would stick. If you've lived it, you know it. And yet, while that feels so obvious, the philanthropic community hasn't invested in leaders of color with that understanding. So just to give you a quick example, uh, we just announced the first group of power fund leaders a few weeks back. Uh, and one organization that we're funding, America on Tech, was started by two co-leaders who both grew up in uh, East New York and Brownsville, two of the most under-resourced communities in New York City, went through public schools, ended up in college together, got interested in technology, and both ended up in private sector tech jobs their year out of college. So they're just three months out of college. They look at each other and they recognize that already they were making four times their household income. Four times, just a few months out of college. And they said, who knows better how to build strategies and supports so that other students who look just like us can end up with the same kind of opportunities we now have in this field. So they tell the story that they sat down on the back of Starbucks napkins, sketched out a plan for the organization that they were gonna build that would provide mentorship when they knew they needed it, that would provide job opportunities, support, instruction, partnerships with tech companies, et cetera. And just five years later, uh, America on Tech is doing incredibly well. 80% of their students are either in tech careers or in college studying technology. And through the investment in the Power Fund, we're both helping to bring America on tech to the next level in its development. But we also have a targeted leader investment on top of the organizational investment that puts dollars behind the professional development of Jessica and Evan, the co-leaders. Because what we know is that if we are serious about 
who needs to be at the table in the discussions, making the decisions about driving economic mobility from poverty, that it's them who need to be there. It's leaders with their connection. Just one other quick example, we're also investing in an organization, One Brooklyn Health Center, that is building a really remarkable and innovative program to address maternal morbidity and infant mortality across central Brooklyn. In New York City, if you're a black mom, you're eight times more likely to die in childbirth than a white mom. And those numbers are even more stark for the under-resourced communities of central Brooklyn. And I highlight this because Larray Brown, who's at the helm of this organization, is the only black woman who is leading a private hospital in all of New York. And when we asked her what she would be excited to do with her personal professional leadership investment dollars that we're providing. She said, I may be the only black woman running a private hospital in New York right now, but I will not be the only for long. And so again, when we think about leadership and how critically important that is to determining, to making moves and shifts in this idea of never seeing a data set as complete if it is not at its origin point, attending to the interplay of health and race, education and race, economics and race, whatever it is, we know that leaders who are connected to the communities are oftentimes gonna drive that conversation. One quick note here, as I think about the kind of data uh, that would be critically influential to the work that we're doing, and that I think is relevant to this broader question of what data is missing uh, as we lean into turning all the change that has happened this year into long-term change. There is data that talks about the effectiveness of diverse leadership in the private sector. The data for the nonprofit sector does not look the same. It is not as robust. I'm being polite there, just in case anyone <laughs> who's involved in this conversation spends time on that data. And to think about the services, the communities that are also often the recipients of nonprofit organizations work, it becomes even more stark to see that that data around the critical nature of diverse leadership in nonprofit social service organizations um, is so sparse. I want to share a second way that we've thought at Robin Hood about how we can contribute to this push for inclusivity of the interplay of racial injustice in any work we're doing in any conversation that we're leading on. Robin Hood, uh, since 2012, has run a truly groundbreaking study of disadvantage in New York City, along with our partners, Columbia University. Unlike typical surveys of poverty that really take a snapshot look, the poverty tracker checks in with the same 4,000 households quarter after quarter after quarter for several years. And by doing so, is able to provide a dynamic view of poverty over time. The study has been instrumental to those in the field of increasing mobility from poverty in considering how we get our solutions to the level of being sustainable so that we're not just supporting programs and efforts that allow for families to get above the poverty line and then slip right back in. So for example, what the poverty tracker data tells us is that while at any given time, uh, about 19% of New Yorkers are experiencing poverty, when we look over the last four years, what we see is that a staggering 50% of New Yorkers have spent at least one year in poverty over the last four about half of New York City, one of the wealthiest cities in the world. 
and I'm just going to pop into the chat in case you're interested some information about the poverty tracker as well. So for many years since the inception of the poverty tracker, everyone involved reported out on poverty data as poverty data in New York City, talking about New Yorkers experiencing hardship, experiencing poverty, tracking the what, the why, being able to put a finger on solutions that were and weren't effective. Now, data broken down by race was tracked in certain places and analyzed in a number of places, but not consistently and not communicated as such. There are 1.6 million people in New York City living in poverty. 80% of them are people of color. Asian New Yorkers are the fastest growing demographic group in poverty in the city. There isn't a story of poverty in New York City that isn't a story of how racism impacts it. Health, well-being, education, opportunity. And so what we've done is flipped the study and its communication on its head so that there isn't a poverty tracker analysis of hardship and poverty in New York City that isn't focused on that interplay of race and poverty. So for example, we just came out with a new spotlight report that focuses on hunger in the wake of the COVID pandemic. And what we saw was that while the data is just tragic across the board, as we all know and would expect, that while nearly 70% of Latinx and Black New Yorkers who lost employment income because of the pandemic, worry that they would run out of food because of the end of the month? Only 33% of New Yorkers who are white, who also lost employment income, had that same worry about running out of food. If you don't look at the race data as part of that question of who is being impacted and how, when you're considering how to drive investment solutions, you haven't seen the real story. And it's just impossible to land on the right solutions. I'm gonna go off for one second because my kids are trying to walk in the door. Hold on one moment. The realities of our current life. Thank you for giving me that moment. So, since the murder of Mr. George Floyd, the philanthropic sector has committed $6 billion to address the issues of race. And that's reflected similarly in decisions, investments, in new departments that have been created in companies, in different organizations, in new hires folks have made, in new commitments to DEI trainings, in new social media campaigns, in new slogans, in monuments falling, in slogans being pulled away, in sports teams' names changing, in personal reflection, in personal questioning, that's the moment we're in. Yet, if all of that questioning, thinking, those dollars, those investments, those policy changes, those systems changes, are relegated to us understanding them as addressing race issues and addressing racism, as opposed to generating a new understanding that there is no table there is no organization, there is no company, there is no policy decision, there is no investment decision in this country that doesn't interplay with racial injustice in this country, then I fear that 2020 will simply be, be that year for the history books. But that the history books won't look different for 2021 and beyond because of what we reckoned with this year. And to those of us who lead on data and those of us who champion and stay close to it, we have a huge role to play in which way this goes. We have what I see as the opportunity 
and also really the obligation to demand a different understanding of where and how race should play into data collection analysis, narrative work and storytelling that builds upon it. So that we never accept that there is a data set or a data story about our American life where race is not essential, where race is not centered, where race is not at the origin of the questions that we're asking around what we're seeking to learn and find out, and ultimately on what answers we land on. I will close there, Jude, and would love to hear if there are any questions. Um, okay, so I am going to reconnect myself if I can figure out how to do this as the, um, uh, how do I do this? Sorry. Um, here we go. I'm going to reclaim myself as a host and I don't think that'll stop you, Sam. Okay, perfect. Okay, there yeah. we go. Hi. Okay. okay. Um, so, um, we have we have a, a, a core group here. I don't have any questions in the Q and A. So here's what I'm going to suggest. I have a couple of questions I will kick off with, and then um, I will suggest that um, all those who are in attendees now we can have a little bit of a roundtable with um, Sam here, and so I can move as Sam's answering my first question, I can move everyone up so that you can, so we can engage more in a more interactive way. Um, if you would prefer not to do that, just send it in the Q&A piece, please just say, I prefer to stay as an attendee and just um, be a participant in that way. Um, and I will respect that decision. So one of the questions, um, Sam, that I think uh, we, you know, Chad and I in our own, own research and activism um, sometimes struggles the wrong word, but but it's it's a it's a conundrum for those of us who are coming at this from the data side, not the data champion side, as you would say, but from the sort of the people who use data, right? Um, is how best to kind of connect with um, with organizations and individuals who are empowered to act and, and just yeah. how to sort of make those connections and yeah. how to sort of listen in an action research kind of methodology and model. Have yeah. you seen models or do you have insights into how we can be better about sort of yeah. building those connections? Yeah, it's such a good question. And I actually think that it is a place where connections with foundations can be incredibly helpful because foundations are so often in conversation, in learning conversations with everyone from community organizations to universities to other philanthropists to hopefully impacted community, that there's an ability to partner to learn that I think could be hard in other places. So I'll just give an example. You know, if, if my advice to you was go direct to community organizations, what we always fear there is the tax and the burden, right? That we don't wanna put on those who are leading the work on the ground to help inform all of us, right? That that tax is, 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 is a big one. And so I think the, the approach of looking to intermediaries who are already doing that work like foundations, quite honestly, in a lot of places is really helpful. The other thing I'll add though, is I think we in the philanthropic sector often mistake uh, community organizations, nonprofits for community. And they are vastly different things a lot of times. Not always, uh, but oftentimes. And so my encouragement is also that, and this is a place where you have to do it in a way that provides compensation right? You have to do it in a way that understands, you know, folks' needs and schedules. You have to do it in a way that builds trust and relationship. But going direct to community for these questions as well, I think is so critically important. At Robinhood, we have something called our Design Insight Group, which is a group of about 1,100 New Yorkers who are experiencing poverty and who engage with uh, the organization on focus groups and surveys and to give input, to do now some participatory grant making work, all paid. 
um, and all through relationships that are built with the organization. And until we started doing that, you would hear folks plug in community organization for community and they're not the same thing. And so those would be, those would be my two sort of pieces of food for thought about, about how to approach that. That's really interesting. So can I say back to you what I think I heard you say? Yeah. So you're talking about sort of going directly to community mm -hmm. as well as to community organizations. Mm -hmm. um, so can I get super real for a minute? Um, yeah. as, a, as a little gay uh, white boy, um, I would be a little bit reluctant to go around community organizations. Like I would be worried about that, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it, it, that's an interesting thing to balance, right? You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I would just uh, almost out of a sense of like being disrespectful, you know what yeah. I mean? Feeling yeah. like, you know, yeah. if people have self-organized there. So I don't know. Um, that yeah. Would, uh, yeah. It gives me something to think about. Um, yeah. Yeah. And again, I think it's why leveraging those relationships, I'm not saying that they are not relationships that are already challenging ones where there are power dynamics, et cetera, that are all in play. But there's a little bit of the piggybacking here for you all that I think makes sense mm -hmm. because when you are in learning mode so that you are able to take that right and learn from that until you're at the point where you really want to create your own focus groups or sets of conversations and at that point i think you attend to what you discussed by really leaning into the kinds of you know facilitators and leaders who are already doing the work so that you're more the you know person who's presenting the questions and the issues right but there are other folks who are actually able to lead the conversation that makes a lot of sense thank you um, all right, so from our um, remaining attendees, we have, we have uh, a, a smaller group. I think some other folks got spooked when I <laughs> offered to bring everybody up into the main group. <laughs> but um, would anyone else uh, like to ask Sam a question or make a comment? I do know that Jess um, uh, Dills texted me and asked if we could get the link to that New York Times um, visualizer. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so that would be great. And uh, sure. once I have that, I'll put that in the um, the link uh, when in the recording of the session. That's great. And I'll just put that right. I just put that right in the chat so you can take a look. Anyone else have questions for Sam? Are you able to hear us, June? I can hear you, Jess. Okay, it's Jessica. I am not at all an, an analyst or a numbers person, but I am um, deeply invested in racial justice across all, um, all avenues, everywhere. I've been sort of on this journey for the last four years and most recently locally um, in a small town here. And I also have- um, Where are you, Jessica? Small I'm town. In town. I'm in Williamstown, Mass. Along with oh, wonderful. Area. My husband went to Amherst. <laughs> nice. Well, you know, we're, we're Williams people, so I'm not sure. I know, I know. I'm just saying, I'm getting a little, a little rivalry, but also a little connection there. I know. <laughs> okay. So, but I have, um, my oldest is an investment banking, sort of venture capital, went to mm. military, all that stuff. And my mm -hmm. youngest is going to graduate in, in a couple of years and is such an incredible um, statistician and mm. numbers person. And I just want to um, sort of guide this next generation. And um, I'm, I'm wondering how Robinhood works, and I'm sure you do this, within the college age population. And so I'm seeing a lot, and I've worked a lot with youth activists in the last four years, yeah. um, that these students understand this new language better and that they will most likely be the most revolutionary. Absolutely. Need. And so I'm, I'm hoping that this is starting to make its way into the education that these kids are getting at schools potentially in New York and, and beyond. So can you speak to that a little bit? Absolutely. And I just, I, I appreciate that question because I think we've done it and there's more we need to do both because we want to be able to share what we've learned, but also because as you're articulating, they're going to push us, right? I mean, so much of what we see as the humps we have to get over, they are not even starting with those in the way. And so for me, it's also the pressure that youth brings to the institutions that's incredibly valuable. But um, I'll just give you an example. We host every year an investors conference. The most 
high profile, you know, world renowned um, leaders in the investing space who have, it's always been a closed conference, um, you know, pay for attendance conference. And this year we opened it up to hundreds of students from HBCUs who are in related fields and did it right at the time where we know that many are going off into interview season. So that not only would they be, you know, well equipped with these new innovative ideas, right, but also would be coming with the sort of expertise, know-how, and additional savvy from having been a part of this. And I share that because I think it's an exemplar of how we're trying to think about this in everything we do. That yes, it's making sure that we're funding the schools and the programs that have this explicit focus on racial justice, so kids are getting that from a young age. But also that any place we hold influence, any place that we curate a table, that we are intentionally opening that up to young people and oftentimes to young people who are not otherwise invited. That's excellent. Thank you so much for that. And on the other end of the spectrum, um, for the sort of entrenched organizations and corporations who do not know how to handle this kind of new thing, yeah. are you getting a lot of, do you do a lot of outreach to those Us. who think they want to change, but they actually have no idea what to do? <laughs> yes, a lot of that. So I think what is, what is the, the, um, the, I think the biggest thing to note is that for those who've never done this before, there is a ton of um, risk they're not willing to take a lot of risks, right? So what you saw was when corporations who'd never given the racial justice space before started to give a bit in this moment, it was all going to NAACP, a uh, wonderful organization, should go there, to Equal Justice Initiative, Brian Stevenson, wonderful organization, should go there. Because those were so well vetted and so trusted that almost anyone felt like they could make a contribution there and not have to worry about it. And oftentimes not have to explain themselves, right, to the folks who are within their space who are not as far along. There was a study that just came out by the Building Movements Project that showed they, they analyzed 400 plus nonprofits across the country in the late spring and summer, right in the heart of this uprising, right? When folks were protesting on the street, when you saw Instagram screens all turning black, right? The organizations that they interviewed, the black led organizations were the only ones that were seeing a decrease in grant revenue. About half of them experienced a decrease in grant revenue. And only about, I think it was 15%, don't quote me on that number, it was around 15 or 20% saw an increase. So the news said, oh my God, this bubble, what is NAACP going to do? They're going to get all this money. Where is it going to go? What are they going to do in future years? That was the story. Again, going to date, right? That was the data story. That was the story about the dollars. That was the story about what you're finding. This other story wasn't out there. And I think what we're trying to do through the Power Fund and all of our efforts is to essentially say, where you trust us as Robin Hood, let us carry that trust into organizations that you otherwise might not. And that along the road, we'll have long conversations that will last for a whole relationship, right? About how to change hearts and minds to go along with that, right? But also I think push the sector to be realistic about what the data is telling us about still who is and isn't getting funded even in this moment. And what that says to us about how quickly we need to change and how aggressively we need to change. Great, thank you so much. Absolutely, thank Happy you. So I know um, Sam and I talked earlier and she has a hard stop at five. So she I do, I'm sorry. So it's been fun I, though. Sam, thank you so much. This has been so lovely. Um, so uh, we appreciate it. Um, the video will be up on um, YouTube. I'll make sure to send you the link. Thank you so much, Sam. Great, it was so nice to spend time with you all. Thank you, Jude. All right, you, cheers. Bye.